This question is a nice math puzzle. It doesn't look so bad. Not a whole lot of information presented in a table, but we read this first. What is the return on capital employed? So it's always a good idea to jot down the formula that we're looking for to get started looking for information to give us a shopping list. So we know that return on capital employed is always going to be the operating profit over the capital employed. Capital employed, as you remember, is the equity and the long-term debt. Now we have some other information here, don't we? We know the gross profit margin, the gross margin, and we know that that is the gross profit over the sales, and that would be 42 over 100. We know the operating profit margin, operating profit margin, that's always going to be the operating profit over the sales, and that is 28 over 100. We have some gearing. I don't need that for now. We also know the asset turnover. I'm just going to abbreviate that asset turnover, and that is equal to sales over capital employed. That is equal to 65 over 100. So with all of this relative information, we could reassemble these figures and get to the capital employed figure. So what's interesting to me is the ratio of the sales to the operating profit, which I can get right here. If sales are 100, operating profit's gonna be 28. And that ratio will hold true wherever we use those two figures. Now, we know that the asset turnover is 65, okay? So we can now just use a little bit of math. We can say, the asset turnover, right, that's going to be 65 over 100. Now, if we come back here to that line, if we say that the capital employed will hold the same ratio, we could then say that's going to be equal to x over 28. Look at that, right, the 100 to the 28. And if we do the math, x comes to... 18.2 and that is my answer for return on capital employed. This question is testing interpretation of ratios. Which statements are true? Well we can only evaluate the statements if we evaluate the performance of the company and let's do that together. The inventory turnover period increased. Without any other information, that's a bad sign. That means we are holding inventory longer. We're less efficient at converting our raw materials into finished goods. Receivables payment period. Okay. Without any other information, it's taking us longer to pay our suppliers. From a liquidity point of view, we could say that's a good that's a good thing, right? We're keeping cash in our pocket longer. But from a supplier goodwill point of view, it might be harming us, but not important right now. Okay? From a liquidity point of view, it's good. Receivables. We're going it's decreasing. 68 to 60. That's a good sign. From a liquidity point of view, okay, our customers are paying us faster. Our credit customers are paying us faster. Instead of waiting 68 days, they pay us 60 days. So that's improving our liquidity. Current ratio, that is the current assets over the current liabilities. That tells us overall our liquidity is dropping. Okay, we are less liquid. Current ratio... It's also dropping. Current ratio, I'm sorry, the quick ratio is also dropping. The quick ratio is now just a more prudent look at our working capital. And we're looking at our current assets minus the inventory. 
in other words, our receivables and our cash, because the inventory is the least liquid of the current assets. And let's be prudent. Maybe we will never turn that inventory into cash because it's obsolete, outdated over current liabilities. And that also shows us a decreasing liquidity position. Okay, now let's look at the statement. Customers are taking longer to pay. Nope, not true. Customers are paying us faster. Okay, so this may have contributed to the decline in the company's current ratio, no way. Inventory levels have increased well, if everything is, is equal, um, except for the, the, the days, then yes, that would hold true. And this may have contributed to the decline in the quick ratio. Well, no, I'm going to cross that one out because quick ratio ignores the impact of inventory. So neither statement is true. Answer everyone is D. Here's an easy test of the balanced scorecard. We have the classic ACCA, evaluate the statements, and it's about balanced scorecard. You remember the balanced scorecard, a framework of evaluating performance where we are considering non-financial as well as financial factors. We look at performance from the financial perspective, from the customer perspective, from the internal processes and the in innovation and learning or learning and growth. Okay, so let's look at a more, let's take a more holistic view of company performance. First statement, it focuses solely on non-financial measures. That is incorrect. It also considers financial. It looks at both internal and external matters. That is true because it also looks at customers. So that would be an external matter. Guys, answer is B, statement two is correct. Here we have a past exam question on the build, building block model. This one is the most obscure of the three models you need. You need to know balance scorecard, you need the value for money model, and you need the building block model. Before we do the statements, let's just quickly review this model. Well, here's that model. And if you remember, this is similar to the balance scorecard. It is a framework for managing performance. It's an evolution of the balanced scorecard from the 1990s, specially created for service organizations. We have three areas of performance management to look at, dimensions. These are the broad areas of performance that should be measured. The first two, financial and competitive, those are called the results. That's what we get. So we have to measure financial, we have to measure market share. How competitive are we? Now, the interesting thing about the model, the model then looks at the drivers or the determinants of success. These are quality, innovation, flexibility, and resource utilization. Determinants or drivers, that's what gives me results. Once we've identified our dimensions, we measure performance with standards. Standards should be assigned to managers. If you don't assign the metric to a manager, no one will look after it, no one will make sure that it's improving. That's the ownership part. Of course, the standard or the target should be achievable. If it's not achievable, you won't work hard to attain your results. And equitable is fairness, should be applied fairly throughout the company following a transparent HR plan or policy. The big departure from the balanced scorecard then is the third block, rewards. Motivation. The rewards should be significant enough to entice you to work harder for your bonus. Okay, so the rewards need to be significant enough to change your behavior. That's motivation. Controllable. That means the reward is linked to your performance. If you work harder, if you have better performance, you get a better reward. And lastly, clarity. Okay, 
the reward policy should be clearly disseminated through the whole company, again, in a transparent HR policy. That is the building block model in a nutshell. Now we can answer this question. Here are the statements. It's four statements. Let's do this in the computer-based exam approach. They wouldn't give you, most likely they wouldn't give this to you as a multiple choice. That would be an easier way to do it. They'd probably give this to you as with, with the boxes and they would say, which of the two statements are correct? So I look through this right away, four jumps out as being correct because it's a performance measurement system for service organizations. We like that. Now, one of those remaining ones is correct, two are incorrect. And number one, the determinants of performance. Okay, remember we have the results and the drivers or determinants. Quality, that one is good. Innovation, resource utilization, and competitiveness, competitiveness, no, no, no. It's innovation is what we want. So that one goes out. Now, it's either two or three. Standards are targets for performance. I like that, and they should be fair, achievable, and controllable. No, 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 I like ownership there, right? They should be assigned to managers. So I'm gonna go with three and four, but let's double check this. Rewards should be clear, that's the clarity, motivating and controllable. So the answer is three and four as the correct statements. This next question is a nice test of the value for money model, where we're looking at performance of a not-for-profit organization, and we're looking at the three E's. Economy, we're looking at the lowest cost inputs. Effectiveness, that's the last E. How well are we reaching our objectives? Are we achieving our mission? And the third one, efficiency, that is maximizing our output per unit of input. This one is usually identifiable because it is a compound metric. Right, it's mixing two things, something over something. The word per is often in an efficiency metrics. We're looking at an accounting service for government organizations. Each staff member works six chargeable hours a day, the rest of the time non-chargeable admin work. The objective is high quality and customer satisfaction. That's gonna help us answer the effectiveness part which one is about quality and customer satisfaction? Three. So it's gotta be this or this. Cutting expenditure by 5%. That's going to be economy, guys. So one is gonna be here or here. Looks like we could already get the answer, couldn't we? Okay, now, last one, increasing number of chargeable hours handled by advisors to 6.2 per day. We're mixing two things, hours and days. That means it's compound. That is the efficiency metric. Answer is D. And our final question in the set, another three E's type of question. This one's quite easy. It's only a line and a half. And a government is trying to assess schools by using a range of metrics. One of the chosen methods, percentage of students passing five or more exams. Well, nothing about resources, nothing about inputs, nothing about cost. It's not economy. Cross out D, expertise is not in the model. I don't see the word per. It's not a compound metric. I don't see anything about outputs to inputs. What I do see, it's most uh, closely related to the quality of education. So I'm going with effectiveness as the best answer there. Answer is C.